All right, I'm on and you can hear me. Fantastic. So thank you. I realize I'm the first speaker after lunch, so I requested that I can move around and get in your face if I see anyone <laughs> dozing off. Um, James and I have known each other forever. We did not coordinate, um, but I'm thrilled that I'm able to pick up on this notion of human-centered AI and bring it into our talk of health, about health and wellness. Um, I'm going to have a shameless plug that's going to sit here while I give you a preview of the talk because we are hiring, hiring, hiring um, across many uh, cross-college interdisciplinary things. So one of the things that I love about being a new dean at the Corey College of Computer Sciences at Northeastern is our foundational commitment to interdisciplinary research and interdisciplinary education. Um, and you see that in the searches, for example, that Brooke and I are coordinating and others. So to all the students and all your colleagues, please tell them about this. And if they don't want to come to Boston, they can pick one of our other campuses as well. So <laughs> back to my background. So James and I are starting at the same place, and we're going to diverge about two-thirds of the way through my talk. So you can look for when it's like, oh, she went left when he went right. Um, so I started. Hmm? I go left. No, no, no. I picked. I picked. Um, so my background, uh, so I was a ubiquitous computing researcher until I was relabeled as an AI researcher. So I was a ubiquitous computing researcher, worked at Georgia Tech, um, and then previous to that, Xerox PARC, um, and have worked in the realm of my lab, which is called Everyday Computing, um, and that looked at uh, different ways about the pervasive availability. Um, so remind the students there were days when we weren't all carrying around like six devices on our own body, not to mention everything in the room. Um, and in the context of this talk, I'm focusing on my work around aging in place. Um, and I put this there, not really to brag, but to say I've been working on this for over 20 years. And part of my talk is a reflection of why have we published so many great research papers, but we've made very little tractable progress um, in, the, in the world. Um, so that's where we're going to examine this topic. Um, and the best way to characterize my research is my definition, close to Wendy Mackay, on technology probes, which is I go through a user-centered design process, I'm going to unpack this later, and then I create kind of under-designed or just designed enough technologies to put them out there for some form of longitudinal assessment. Um, so I've done this around caregiver awareness and peace of mind. I've done this in mobile technologies for diabetes management um, and for support for breast cancer patients. And then um, more recently, I've been working with uh, the use around conversational assistance. So I'm going to touch on those projects briefly, just enough for folks to go uh, look up the papers, um, but mostly then to critique our work and say what has been left out thus far. So before I became an AI researcher and I was just approaching this, the way I looked at this type of research was first is, um, you know, what was I pulling from ubiquitous computing? So pervasive sensing. Uh, some notion of natural interaction, technologies that could be integrated into everyday environments. Um, and then we worked with an HCI process that always involves some form of ethnographic styled uh, informant inquiry uh, to be able to receive insights within to uh, the problem domain, some form of co-design process, uh, whether it was labeled participatory or not, and then definitely within uh, the realm of field evaluation. Now, I was a properly trained computer scientist with a uh, minor in uh, psychology and human factors, but nevertheless, that left me pretty much unequipped to understand how to like, move the needle with respect to uh, health and well-being. So uh, lots of work over the years trying to figure out what theoretical basis and framings could help inform my work to both kind of point me in the right direction to design and also to understand evaluation. So everything from the health belief model and uh, you know, understanding different notions of lo locus of control or social cognitive theory, but then also going into sense making and cultivation theory to understand the role of media uh, technologies and media interaction uh, with respect to some of the, our areas of research. And from a health outcomes perspective, I was, I was one of those folks that um, I didn't start out working with physicians. In fact, I just now recently work with physicians. I was that outsider trying to come in. And so I tended not to look at clinical outcomes, and I tended not to look at clin clinical uh, encounters. Um, and I've never enjoyed working with any electronic healthcare record system. Um, <laughs> so I tend to focus on things like supporting independence, supporting disease management in day-to-day -day life, um, trying to and understand opportunities for behavior change and when those would be desired, and especially looking at the scale of healthcare delivery. And this is one area where James and I come together, which is I always looked at these technologies not as an automation or a replacement, but as a way of augmenting um, existing services. And in two, so many of our healthcare settings, 
I was looking at whether it was informal caregivers, our cancer navigators, our facilitators of healthcare, who were vastly outnumbered by the demands on the system. So anything that I could do to learn from and scale what they could accomplish was really where I wanted to go. And so in the middle, again, around this notion of technology probes, I worked on uh, technologies around awareness of how someone was doing in their home from an aging place perspective, problem solving, how could I improve patient engagement, and then compensatory cognitive scaffolding, which is a very fancy way of saying what are services in the home that could aid individuals with cognitive decline. All right, so flying through this quickly, because then I'm going to critique everything I did. Um, so uh, we're now in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, this was our first work. So this is when we had to break apart the computers and build everything ourselves. Uh, looked at how could we support peace of mind awareness for someone who is concerned about an elderly parent living by themselves. This work hit a nerve in the sense that every time I would give conference presentations, people would come up to me not to ask me about like the research, but like how do I get this for my parents? Right? So incredibly common problem, incredibly difficult. Where were we successful? So we were able to demonstrate that if you could have some form of pervasive sensing, we had our own version of motion sensing, can unpack that later. Um, we could support uh, a connection, a family connection between um, an adult child, you know, checking in or am concerned about the independence of his mom. And we could also design a system that she didn't like unplug and throw out the window, which was part of my concern during that, that long field trial. Um, the question that one was desired to be answered in this was, how do I know if my mom had a normal day, right? How do I know if everything is kind of okay and, you know, I just, you know, peace of mind, just want to get a sense of that. You're not going to be surprised to learn that the notion of normal <laughs> is very complicated, right? And so how we could actually design a flexible system to convey a normal day is I think now a lifelong career question that I get to continue working on. Um, and then even also more exciting was the question of who, what family members, which family members and how to do this was really complicated. So in interviews we'd hear from, well, my daughter can have that, but not my son because I don't like his wife, uh, but my niece, I really like her, what about her? So how this fit within family relationships uh, was also uh, work left to be done. Um, from then, you can tell the dating of the technology. Remember Nokia? Um, <laughs> so I, then I started working on technologies around aging, but in this case, the conditions that, if unmanaged, would force someone to have to move from an independent setting. So uh, I worked with Lena Mamikina. Uh, so this was her dissertation work. She's now tenured at Columbia Medical on diabetes management. And then again, our informant in this case, we worked with the diabetes educator and she, you know, she said, look, I can teach people all day long, right? They can, they can be in a class, they can take a pre-test and a post-test, and I can show that they can learn about diabetes and they don't change anything, right? So she said, they need to learn to be detectives. They have to be detectives about their own bodies and their own habits, like design a detective tool. So we did our best to design a detective tool very simple mobile device allowed people anytime diabetes reared its head, like capture that moment and then package that information and send it to the diabetes educator. Lots of things worked, not everything worked, but we did learn that from a diabetes educator point of view, it was kind of life altering from her perspective, right? Because suddenly instead of getting these abstract questions in class about healthy portions, she's getting pictures of what people were actually eating. Um, and she was getting questions uh, that would help her like effectively coach them you can come back to coaching um, what we saw from the individual's perspective is that what really worked for them was not like become the best diabetic you could ever be because I haven't met anyone that wants to do that um, but they would peel off individual goals it's like okay uh, you know what is going to be my breakfast routine what is going to be you know what is going to be my uh, the snack routine in the evenings turned out to be really important what do I eat when I go out with my friends on Tuesday night to our favorite Chinese restaurant? So again, this notion of normal um, and what work turned out to be very individualized. I'm driving all the cases for AI, James. Um, but it, um, but they, they had to be able to work within that. So I got excited about coaching. So, because scaling what coaching could do would be really interesting. So then I got really lucky and I got to work with Maya Jacobs. She takes all the questions for this slide. Um, <laughs> so uh, we worked on a system to support, in this case I went from newly diagnosed diabetics to newly diagnosed breast cancer patients, um, in this notion of how could 
we support someone day, day in and day out through that journey, through kind of diagnosis to treatment, um, and then continuing into survivorship. So what did we learn from this? Well, just like my uh, folks with diabetes who like really wanted to figure out how to make it work within their daily life, likewise for the cancer patients we worked with, they didn't think of themselves, surprise, surprise, as a patient, and they didn't think of their cancer as only that thing that was associated with the physician, but it was like, how do I talk to family and friends, and how do I manage this, and what over-the-counter lotions should I use? and I'm really depressed, I'm really anxious, or I'm trying to manage this with the children, and oh, by the way, my spouse just died, how do I manage that? So this notion of breaking apart from a disease mentality of here's what they need to know about cancer versus how do you support someone kind of through all aspects of their daily life through this journey turned out to be incredibly important. So holistic in the sense it was about the whole person, Personalized in the sense that we could feed it information about diagnosis and what we knew, but adaptive, how could, it, how could it respond to them as instead of now, in this case, not the human coach that we had, but now our AI coach, like, okay, this is what I'm worrying about. Okay, here's the most important thing for you to think about right now. Vastly successful, Maya gets all the credit. Um, <laughs> so what I've been doing more recently is, um, uh, before I became dean, uh, what I was doing before that, um, was working with the Cognitive Empowerment Program uh, with the Emory Brain Health Center. So in this case, I'm working with a group that um, new, folks newly diagnosed, there's the theme, newly diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. Almost all of these individuals will, um, if left untreated, will probably proceed, it, uh, proceed into more severe dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Um, what I love about this is that they already had the holistic part built in. Right, um, and it's about lifestyle interventions because despite what you read, very little of the drug, drug trials about combating Alzheimer's, just, you know, save your money. Um, so the question is like, what can we do around uh, health and wellness and support and education and nutrition and again, those AI services that maybe could provide like that gap or support uh, for people on a day-to-day -day basis, which got me working with conversational assistance. So a lot of excitement. This was also something we could manage to deploy during the pandemic um, for how families could use um, a conversational assistant. In this case, we chose Google Home Hub for a set of reasons, quote, out of the box. So we've now deployed these systems to ooh, just shy of 100 families. Um, and understanding with different forms of training and different forms of support, like what do, what do they do with it and how? Um, so they do love it. Um, some really interesting ways. This is now uh, Tamara Zudeby, who's a PhD student still working with me at Georgia Tech. Um, assessing use based on the complexity of interaction types. This won't surprise this group, but kind of the more stringent and requirements for interacting with the system, the less likely people are able to use it. So asking about the weather is easy. Asking for something kind of more personalized to an individual or setting an alarm. Um, harder, so less and less use. What was really interesting in this was understanding the dyadic use. So the person with mild cognitive impairment is using the system, but who's really using it more? Their caregiver, right? And you could just see it in the logs, right? So you could see folks who, um, like the, the adult caregiver, it's almost always a spouse, still an aging adult in all, in all of these cases. So they're busy setting up alarms and reminders and all of these things such that when the person who has MCI throughout the day can say, okay, you know, what are we doing this afternoon? The system can tell them. You know, where is so-and-so? The system can tell them. Um, so figuring out the balance was really about designing for that system. And that was a beautiful aha for us. And I can promise you very little in the Google Home Hub or any existing commercial system that supports that. Um, and then, we, of course, we did start to play with our own design. So we have uh, designed a system called Matcha, because it's fun, um, and it's for medication support. And so my student, uh, Naharika Mathur, is uh, going to be presenting this very, very soon at the Assets uh, Conference. So yay for her. This is uh, up for best paper. Um, and what we learned in that, again, was to design for the dyad, right? So from the get-go, it is this notion of, okay, well, you're reminding me, but my husband is also getting kind of just enough information, by the way. 
to check in. And uh, in the case of medication support, it's not necessarily, you know, if, it, if you nag me to death, I promise I will quit using it. But if you just kind of just check in, like, hey, Beth, it looks like you've taken your medication day. Just checking in. Yeah, I did. Yay, go girl. Um, that kind of interaction was supported, right? And oh, by the way, it's like, yeah, we're just going to let your husband know. Med's all good today. Yay, great. So this relationship of how to design for the dyad to not be a system that is like, OK, do as you're told, but works flexibly with people, respecting them. Another kudos to James on this. Um, allowed for something that people actually used more over time instead of less over time. So very exciting work. All right, I'm breezing by this awfully quickly because I want to get to the main point. So what did we do? So we created a bunch of UB comp. You know, as I said, I became an AI researcher somewhere when the branding changed. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, continue doing this work, and, and what did we see? Well, we saw systems that people could use over the long term that would fit very specific needs. I'm gonna get back to that. Um, how can I continue to inform AI work for a long, long time? Dramatic needs for personalization, right? Tailorable to the relationship, tailorable what is normal. Personalized goal setting and decision making for diabetes management. Every single person was different. They were their own detective. How do you support that? Um, uh, calling that hyper-personalization. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know. Um, this notion of, again, every cancer journey is different. Um, so I actually someday want to do this work on journey phenotyping, which is that it's not about the ca cancer diagnosis, but it's the cancer diagnosis of a woman who still has two kids and holding down a job, and their journey is incredibly different than a can woman who's retired and living by herself versus a woman who... Uh, I don't know, make something up, is childless, but is really dependent on her faith-based community. All of those support systems interactions should be incredibly different, right? And that's what would really be effective uh, for these individuals. Um, the Google Home Hub, I do want to get the little thing that you mentioned that does the wake word, uh, but I need to, f to flip it. It's so rigid. It is so, you, our participants describe it as, um, I don't talk Googleese. Right? I don't talk the way it wants me to talk. And especially, there's no way I can tell someone with mild cognitive impairment, you must talk to it this way. Right? So this notion of being able to create that flexibility for how they interact with the system, but nevertheless then work them through the conversation so they can get uh, to, where they need to where they need to be and what they want to be able to accomplish. So many design trade-offs. I'm now really excited that I'm working with Larry Heck um, kind of on the next generation of what these systems. Okay, so why am I not just doing a victory lap? Um, <laughs> so in reflection, remember I mentioned that, that paper over 20 years ago? We laid this out over 20 years ago. We knew what the opportunities were. We knew what the technical roadmap would be. Why is this not out there changing people's lives? Okay, so I'm starting to look at other um, critical lenses, other ways of looking at this type of research to say, um, we can produce a lot of promising technology, human-centered work, um, but where do we need to push further for actual success? Um, so first, uh, credits to Megan Hoffman, Jennifer Mankoff, and crew. Uh, Megan, we just hired last year. Um, uh, understanding disability theory and where this fits uh, into it. Um, I'm not working on assistive technology per se, but the lines between assistive technology and designing for individuals with a chronic disease, I'm not quite sure where that line really is. I think it's a classification, but not in a way that actually informs uh, my work or, or constrains our work. Um, but look at these notions. Oversimplification. Framing disability as a discrete and isolated block of diagnoses. Framing diabetes as an isolated diagnosis. Framing cancer as an isolated diagnosis, right? The whole person, not patient, um, is a critical part to that. And so I think there's a great deal that we can learn from a long history of work in assistive technologies and disability theory that can help us maybe move the needle with respect to design for chronic disease management. Also, connection, undervaluing the support systems, professional, familiar, and caring relationships. All of the systems that I worked on required that secret sauce of technology support somewhere in the midst. 
And so what am I doing? I'm lining up creating systems that if the right friend or the right adult child or the right neighbor or the very expensive healthcare system does it, provides all that kind of techn technology handholding, then it will work, right? But what do we know about the majority of individuals? They don't have access to those kinds of resources, right? We've learned this in education research and other areas. We need to really bring that into the work that we're doing. Second, uh, shout out to Katie Sieg, Amanda Lazar, and others. Um, uh, so they, they refer to this as diffractive analysis. Um, maybe this is just my way of saying that when an AI researcher comes up to me and says, Beth, I need to do a focus group with your older adults because I'm going to ask them how AI can help them. All right. The last time I tried to do that because they asked me to, they told me to improve TV remote controls. <laughs> now, I agree. I help my mom with technology every week. The TV remote controls are awful, but that is not going to answer that's going to allow us to push the kind of the frontier of AI. Um, so Katie and others have, you know, essentially, essentially this boils down to like how you ask and how you set it up. You're going to get very different answers. So participatory design is great. Inquiry is great, but at least do it from different perspectives so that you can triangulate and understand what's really going on. Um, it's, it's not as easy as we make it sound when we teach those HCI design classes. Um, and then finally, and this is Tiffany's uh, work with others, um, spending a lot of time on what uh, they have def uh, determined as combating intervention generated inequality. All right, so this is a long way of saying, let's say we are successful, we design technologies that are great. The last thing I want is my work to actually increase healthcare disparities because of inequality in access, inequality in uptake based on existing technology um, uh, uh, expertise, inequality in, in inheritance because of a misalignment with respect to, to health goals and wellness that are culturally held, inequality in effectiveness because um, okay, let's say it's an AI system that's based on data that's truly biased in terms of the data that it had access to. So understanding that we can make things worse if we're not really careful to these types of frameworks. And so finally we get to a paper where I get to pull everyone together. So I've got Tiffany and Katie and myself and Lena and others, Andrea Parker Grimes. You know, what does it mean if we look at a model of healthcare, the healthcare system and healthcare interventions. And so this is from the Extended World Health Organization for a model of healthcare disparities. Like where did the disparities come from? And the key argument in this paper is arguing for, um, for upstream health informatics, right? That so much of our work, because I came at it from that old UBCOMP angle and that old HCI design for individuals angle, focused on downstream. Like, let's help the individuals do something, right? Let's change individuals' behavior. But how do we move upstream? So I'm designing for the families. I'm designing for the communities. I'm designing for the system because I now think I have 20 years of evidence why designing for the individual isn't going to work. All right, I'm talking really fast because I still want to get to one more point. So if I look back on this portfolio of work, right, community-centric trust, community services, uh, understanding and supporting caregivers, understanding that it's not, it's a capability model, not a deficit model. So let's take the perspective around disability studies and disability theory and also apply it to community-centric organizations. Not about, we always love to come in like what's missing, Ooh, we can fill it with technology, right? It's not about what's missing, it's like, okay, what is there? What are the, the goals and the aspirations and strengths? How do we amplify, how do we augment for individuals and communities and families to achieve their goals? All right, I'm going to steal just a few more minutes because I've got one more point I want to make. I'm the dean. All right, I'm going to skip all that. So this is my new, I'm starting to work on this, right? So uh, what are kind of new tech, so I'm going, to, I'm going to say, yeah, I at least collaborate with AI people. Maybe I'm an AI person. New HCI design process, so Jody, there's your call out for service design. You're going to take that tomorrow. Um, I need a new theoretical base, um, and I'm looking for this audience and our community to figure that out. Um, and I think the types of interventions I'm creating uh, will need to change. All right, what am I so keen to get to? Um, so I'm going to go back to that Cory College of Computer Sciences. Um, and so James has been off talking to AI researchers 
I've been off talking to the NSF and others about the future of computing research. So I wanted to share a few slides with you on what I told them because I think it's important for our community and I'm hoping we can be allies in this. So again, love being a dean. The mission for the Corey College of Computer Sciences is computer science for everyone. Uh, Carla Broadley gets all the credit. I just said, this is great. I'm going to keep running with this. And Carla focused on computer science educational access, and she is still pushing that. I'm working the other half of the equation, which boils down to if computer science is for everyone, then everyone should benefit. Right? What does it mean for us to commit our research ecosystems to say it's not the top 1%, 5%, and it's certainly not just the, the the bros in the valley, um, but it's what do we need to do collectively, and it's not easy, but what do we need to do collectively so that the types of investments we're making of our time and energy and our resources can actually benefit everyone. So that's the goal I'm after, just, just that. Um, and so the things that I argued in front of NSF and others is if you look at the history of computer science innovation and you interview folks and you kind of read the narrative, um, Historically, computer science research focused on, as they will describe it, the sheer act of creation. Um, we were a field with a big chip on our shoulders because nobody believed we could do it anyway. And it's like, we're going to build the first X. We're going to like show that this can work. No one believes it's possible. It's going to take us 30 years to get neural networks, but we're going to do it. Um, but the sheer act of creation focused on, created a focus on early adopters. So how many people have heard the horrible phrase, eat our own dog food? OK, yep. So I worked at Park. I mean, so you know, the Andrew Project, right? That we all came from different variants of this. And because of that, we got really, really comfortable building for ourselves, right? I remember the studies. It's like, oh, we need to submit the Kai paper in two days. Go grab some people down the hallway and see. Uh, right. And technically, Kai's gotten better than that, but the ethos is still there. Right? And this is still how we, and that ethos has now gone into, well, we're going to design things for ourselves. And by the way, it's OK for us to move fast and break things in the process. What would it mean if we decided that computer science was about, quote, the edge cases from human experience? So again, I'm pulling in the notion of accessibility. I'm pulling in the notion that, as I told my students every time I taught them, as soon as you start designing for other people than yourselves, then all the lights turn on in terms of the insights and the opportunities. You just have to do harder work to get there. Um, and it's not a hard argument to say that by, by designing for individuals who have been the least served or the least at the table, then you get amazing insights. And this is where I want you guys to work with me on this. Because when I give some versions of this, they're like, oh, Beth, HCI, use inspired, fine, fine, fine. You're just talking about apps. I'm like, no. I am not talking about apps. I'm talking about innovation up and down the stack when we build alliances across our fields such that that orientation leads us to amazing, amazing discoveries. Um, so you know about accessibility and you know about health because you're already in here. Um, internet safety for, uh, for trans users. Uh, affirmative consent. Is Eric still here? OK, Eric Gilbert's work, brilliant, just amazing. Um, differential privacy, the work Cynthia Dwork, John Ullman, and others. Um, uh, uh, Shonda Kritz, uh, robotics for like small-scale dairy farmers. Uh, uh, new technologies, edge, edge computing technologies for agriculture. Um, all of the things that are being done in terms of like, uh, she has this amazing paper, end-to-end -end distributed Internet of Things systems when you look at wildlife pr protection. So when you take yourself out of that comfort zone of kind of designing that sheer act of creation, and I know now I'm talking to the computer scientist, and there's like five of you in the room, so you can wave back at me. Um, but when you take yourself out of that stance and push yourself, make the commitment, and this is a commitment we're making in our college, to provide the resources to enable this kind of research, you can do amazing, amazing things. So. I'm going to be preaching this for in the next few years, um, and I hope to be able to work with you on it. And yeah, we're hiring. Um, <laughs> so thank you.